All right, we're ready to begin. Thank you for coming to the July 26th meeting of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. If you'd stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Mr. Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Supervisor Pine? Here. Supervisor Groom? Present. Supervisor Horsley? Here. Supervisor Tissier? Here. President Slocum? Here. Ms. Clerk. Thank Sorry. you. No problem. <laughs> um, now we'll move on to uh, public comment. So public comment is, is reserved for persons wishing to address the board on any county-related matters that are not otherwise on the meeting agenda listed on the consent agenda, county manager's report, or the board member's report. All public comments are limited to two minutes, but an ex extension can be provided to you at the discretion of the board president. So, Mr. President, we have uh, three speakers currently. Thank you. First one is Martin Fox. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, President Slocum, members of the board, my fellow veteran, Mr. Malpe, and county council, Mr. Byers. Thank you for your service to the county. Please help the persons and family members of persons living with serious mental illness who lack the capacity to seek treatment voluntarily. Receive Allura's Law Services by directing the development of a training program for improving the delivery of services to the mentally ill and commending the Measure A Oversight Committee's courageous February 23rd report that 239 of the 283 persons who were released under the Early Review of Mentally Ill People in Jail program did not connect with the community-based services they needed. A training program for improving the delivery of services to the mentally ill must be developed as a matter of statute and because it makes a response to the civil grand jury's report issued last week more credible. Our former county manager proposed cutting San Mateo Medical Center's acute psychiatric care treatment beds by 20% to your predecessors on March 29, 2011. Your predecessors approved his proposal unanimously as two members of the board of directors of the local chapter of NAMI remained seated and silent in June 2011. The next month, Sequoia Hospital announced it was closing its 22-bed acute care psychiatric care treatment ward on July 29, 2011. Incredibly, the medical center's spokesman at that time told the press that there will be no significant impact on capacity or quality of care. Developing a training program for improving the delivery services to the mentally ill is an important part of Laura's law. Please help the persons and family members of persons living with serious mental illness who lack the capacity to seek treatment voluntarily receive Laura's Law Services by supporting the development of a training program for improving the delivery of services to the mentally ill and commend the Measure A Oversight Committee for its courageous report that the Early Review of Mentally Ill People in Jail program failed to connect 239 of the 283 persons who were released with the community-based service services that they needed. Thank you. Next, we have Marsha Yates, followed by Michael Stogner. Good morning, board, and uh, thank you for your service. My name is Marsha Yates. I live in Moss Beach. Mid-Pen Housing, supported by the Bo uh, San Mateo uh, County Board of Supervisors via proposed funding assistance, are wanting the residents of the Mid-Coast community um, specifically Montara and Moss Beach, to embrace a high-dancing housing project. The Midcoast Scenic Highway 1 and Highway 92 are the only roads in, to, and from, and through it. We project this proposed housing project will add four to 500 more uh, car trips on the roads that are already at capacity. No new roads can or will be built. There seems to be an institutional disconnect between job availability, transportation systems, and housing with this project. There are a few jobs in the unincorporated mid-coast area. Increased housing in this region of low job opportunity, no transportation alternatives, equals increased overall driving, VMT, long commutes, more traffic um, p congestion, road safety issues, more pollution, and increased transportation costs. I implore the board to redirect MidPen to choose a more centralized location for this project, a location that will promote and strengthen the connection between job centers, high-density housing, 
equitable access to transportation systems and transportation. Mindful project placement makes funding way more effective. Thank you. Next is Michael Stockner. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Michael Stogner. I'm from San Carlos, California. I've been a uh, resident of San Mateo County all my life. I just wanted to make a, one statement regarding the appointment of Carlos G. Bolanos to Sheriff of San Mateo County. Uh, and that was not on the agenda for July 12th, 2016. So I'm here to say that the entire process was skipped and 750,000 residents were skipped. Thank you. No more speakers, Mr. President. Thank you. Now we'll have to, <laughs> we will do an action to set the agenda. And I understand that item number six is pulled and will be heard on August 8th. I'll move to set the agenda and approve the consent agenda items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we'll move to presentations and awards. The first item is accept the 2015 San Mateo County Agricultural Crop Report. Um, Mr. Crowler. Suki. I'm Fred Crowder, the County Agricultural Commissioner and a sealer of weights and measures. And thank you for the opportunity today to present our 2015 annual crop report. So the cover recognizes our uh, and features our organic industry, which is a small but important slice of our, uh, our farming community. So I wish I had better news. Well, this clicker is different than the one we worked with earlier. There we go. Um, Unfortunately, our, uh, our value for annual crop report dropped by $19.6 million this past year. I'll go into the reasons for that a little bit later, but um, the total value for 2016 was $132 million versus $114 million last year. Excuse me, $152 million last year. Um, though unexpected, that drop is not unprecedented. We have had events in the past, such as El Nino years, um, international trade agreements for flowers and those types of things, um, businesses going out of business that have affected our industry to the extent of in some years $30 million. So um, it is unfortunate, but not unprecedented. Looking at the commodity group summaries, um, these are not the individual commodities themselves, but the commodity groups within the report. The floral and nursery group, nursery group which includes both um, outdoor and indoor ornamentals, is uh, down by $24 million. I'll go into that a little bit more later as well. Vegetable crop is $5.7 million. That includes the Brussels sprouts group for the Brussels sprouts, and uh, it's up significantly. Fruit and nut dropped $310,000, and that's a result of largely wine grapes. Early in the season, we had poor fruit set, and uh, due to bad um, environmental conditions, a lot of rain. Um, forest products was down by $1.2 million. That's probably a result of um, rotational harvest practices by the timber industry along the uh, San Mateo Santa Cruz border. So livestock, um, interestingly enough, is up $187,000, which um, in spite of the drought, um, we're, we're seeing increases in the livestock industry because there's fewer head out there on the range. So clearly we're paying more for our beef. Um, livestock products and apiary is up by $28,000, and field crops um, is up by $150,000. In spite of those increases, uh, we still have a, um, a net loss of $19.6 million. So notable changes. I'm not going to go through the crop report page by page. Just I'd like to go over the uh, later talk about the, the reasons for the, the losses um, and the economics of our industry, but uh, the notable changes within um, individual commodities within those commodity groups. Um, indoor potted plants are the, are the big loser, down by 24% or $23 million. Um, Brussels sprouts is up by 21%. Um, they're up to $15.2 million. This is an increase of $3.2 million. Um, we actually passed Santa Cruz last year. and We were the number one Brussels sprout producer in California, possibly the nation. 
Um, unfortunately, Santa Cruz overtook us again. They planted more acreage. They're evil down there. But um, so, uh, yeah, we're number two again this year. But forest products down 36%. I already discussed that. So local factors influencing ag production. Um, you know, these aren't just local. Some of them are, but um, this, these affect all industries. I mean, competition. Water for us is important, especially on the coast side. We have prime ag land over there, but we don't have water to produce crop. And so we're, we're working on it, developing water resources um, and improving water resources over there. But certainly economics, infrastructure, and labor availability. Labor is something that has always been a concern, and it's in, but it hasn't been a factor that has risen to the level to where it's actually influenced um, operational decisions on the farm. This is, this is a first. So the reasons we're seeing um, you know, difficulty getting labor in the agricultural fields is uh, you know, the farm pool has shrunk as a result of these reasons here on the slide. Um, workers no longer seek out producers. It used to be that growers would have people coming to them looking for work. Um, that is no longer the case. San Mateo County is additionally compounded by the fact that we're, we're relatively remote out here on the peninsula. We have a relatively small industry and it's an expensive place to live. There's a high cost of living. And so that provides a disincentive for individuals to come here. <clears throat> um, organic production. This is something that's been of interest to the board in the past, and it's always is to me. Um, this past year, organic value increased about 20% to $6.2 million. Um, our acreage dropped a little bit. It's not really statistically significant, but the number of farms increased by five. So we have more farmers on about the same acreage. Uh, most organic producers sell direct, either at farmers markets or through CSAs, community supported agriculture, or they're selling direct to restaurants and hotels. Um, the fact that that direct marketing provides a real um, a couple, it's a twofer for them, is that when you sell direct, you eliminate the middleman, and so they they're getting retail prices for their crop as well as premium for the organic, um, being organic produced. What this does, it allows organic producers on relatively small properties to be able to produce things like lettuces, cabbages, um, tomatoes, um, carrots, low value ag commodities that normally in this community we would not be able to grow and pay the note on the land because it's expensive to do business here. But um, so this, so by growing organic and doing small acreages, selling direct, it allows um, them to be able to get around the alternative um, conventional high value crops that we traditionally produce here, things like Brussels sprouts. Um, leeks and artichokes, but there are challenges with organic production. Um, it's a it's an increased complexity to the operation. It uh, there's additional record keeping that goes with it. Um, if you're going to be certified as organic, you have to be accredited. You know, there's accreditation agency has to certify you, and um, you have to maintain a lot of records. And um, and there's a lot of marketing that goes with it as well because they're not selling through a single outlet, as as a broker might do, um, or as our growers might do with a broker. And so it, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. So farmer's markets is primarily where our organic producers sell. We have 27 markets here in the county and about 900 market days. On any given time, we have about three and a half mar or two and a half markets going on during the peak season. And uh, that includes about 200 um, producers who are selling at those markets. Of those 200 producers, about 170 are coming from San Mateo, excuse me, 170 are coming from outside San Mateo County and about 30 of them are from within San Mateo County. Um, conventional producers also sell at the farmer's markets, um, but there is as much marketing as farming at the markets, and so they generally use it to supplement sales, um, and the sales relative to their production are very low. Um, our conventional producers will be producing hundreds of acres of a single crop, and you can't distribute and market that through farmer's markets, um, except for on a small, small level. So we have a sustainable agriculture report on page eight. It's required by the Food and Agricultural Code. I'm not gonna go into it here, but I would encourage you to take a look at it. It talks a little bit more about our, our uh, agricultural industry and um, integrated pest management practices and biocontrol organisms. And it talks a little bit about our department's activities. Um, looking back at agricultural production over the past decade, this is the graph we typically show. It's over 10 years, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, comes back down again. Sometimes it finishes up, but it doesn't tell us a lot of information, really. Um, if we want to get a better view of our industry, the direction it's going, and where it's been, we have 
55 years of crop reports going back to 1940. And so this chart here graphs um, the agricultural value of those reports. The bottom line is the just the dollar value. It starts at $7 million there in 1940, and it um, ends at $132 million on the right. The line above it is that same value adjusted for inflation. And uh, you know, looking at that, we can see that it peaks in 1945. Um, clearly, that's the war years. Then it peaks again in not, this, not the Golden State war years. It is the war years. Um, so, and then it peaks again in 1991, um, which is actually the same year that uh, the US suspended the trade and import agreements with, uh, on Colombian flowers. And so that's not solely responsible for the decline in our ag industry, but it has, plays a big part in it. On the average, this comes to about $132 million per year. Um, but uh, you know, when, when we look at the years between 1945 and 1965, you know, those are probably more likely what a normal year is for San Mateo County, which is in the range of 130 to $140 million. So breaking this out a little bit further, um, this chart the charts the um, crop value and nursery value. The crop value is the blue lines on the bottom, nursery value is on the top, and that red line is actually um, population growth, which has had an influence on our industry. As population growth has gone up, clearly the, the crop production has gone down, um, but nursery production has gone up. I mean, the crop loss is due to land development. Most of the crops we had, a lot of the crops we had growing were on the bay side. And so with development, we lost all that bay side. Um, additionally, um, those, those years also coincide with the Central Valley Water Project. They coincide with refrigeration, the national um, transportation system. And all these things regionalized our agricultural influences. We got away from local agriculture and we got into regional. And so it brought in more competition, especially for the crops. And so that pushed them even further down. Um, and the, the green lines, um, that's our nursery industry. It continues to expand in spite of growing population. A lot of our nursery industry was on the coast, and so it might not have been impacted by it. But also the nursery industry thrives on a relatively small footprint of land. It's a very intensive agriculture. They can produce multiple crops. Um, and they have very high returns. And that's why very high returns. And that's where they constitute the bulk you know, of our agricultural value. Because on a very small footprint of land, they can produce a lot of crop. We've also always had a nursery industry here. Um, San Mateo County is an ideal climate for it. Um, we're also situated next to the national cemeteries, and so there's a lot of use of our crop flowers and, and nursery products. Um, being situated next to the greater Bay Area, there's hotels, restaurants, and a population that appreciates ornamental plants. Um, so that has driven our nursery industry, um, and, and, and competition has suppressed our crop industry. Of course, that changed in 1991. Competition came to our nursery industry. But here we see in this graphic, um, I apologize that the writing is relatively small. The 57%, the brightly colored um, fuchsia um, slice of that pie on the left there, that is the indoor nursery operation. That's the value um, as a percentage of our overall industry. The purple on the top is 15%. That's um, our outdoor nursery industry. And the 21% um, on the right, that's our vegetable crop production. So 21% um, of our nurse, of our, of the value of our industry is, is vegetables. 15% is uh, um, the outdoor. 57% is the indoor. That 57% is produced on 180 acres of land. That's it. Um, the outdoor production is produced on about 660 acres. The 21 percent of vegetables is produced on 2,100 2100 acres of land. So the um, differential between earnings um, for indoor nursery is tremendous between outdoor crop. Um, and it has a very small footprint, but um, those are the types of conditions that help it thrive. But it's also very labor intensive. And without labor, which is something that we've just been discussing, there's going to be substantial impacts within that industry. Um, if they had, they're, they're struggling economically as well. If they had the resources to bring in additional um, ag labor through farm contractors, they, they might do that. Uh, if they had resources to be able to mechanize, some of them are doing that. But at this point in time, um, that loss of labor has substantially impacted our, um, the, the overall value of that industry. So um, 
This is another graphic that we have in the, in the report, and it is a breakout of, of producers per commodity group. And uh, it's actually, it's relatively balanced. It's a very nicely sliced pie. I was surprised to see that. I would, have, I would have expected to see more nursery producers, but they're very much in line with um, the rest of the producers within the community. So um, the largest factors affecting, as I mentioned, are competition and market and economic influences. And these are things that are really beyond our capacity to control. Um, but we do have programs. There are some things that we can um, control. And you know, through, uh, through your support, things like the As Fresh As It Gets program, the Agricultural Law Ombudsman, working on planning and zoning regulations, and, um, and the Williamson Act, you know, we can try to relieve this burden a little bit on our agricultural community. So um, that concludes my report. Thank you for your time and your attention. It is available on our county, on our department uh, website. If you um, click on our entry page, it is right there front and center. So thank you. I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, M Supervisor Horsley. Uh, how did you know I wanted to say something about agriculture? <laughs> uh, Please. Just want to say a little bit about the labor shortage. Obviously, you've talked about immigration policy and, you know, the the, um, the difficulty on the coast side, it's, it's, um, it's it's pretty remote. Um, the cost of living is extremely high, and uh, housing obviously is influenced by the base side. So it's um, a significant uh, cost for uh, people who are involved in agriculture. And we are doing this uh, just about finished with an agricultural workforce needs assessment. <clears throat> I think people would be surprised at the number of uh, people who are involved in agriculture on the coast. It's actually in a neighborhood about, about 1,700 maybe even as high as 2,000. It's pretty tough to count everyone. But we've had staff going out, uh, actually the same people who are doing uh, North Fair, Fair Oaks Forward have gone off and interviewed uh, both workers as well as uh, producers. And so that's how we've come up with that number. So it's pretty large. Uh, one of the things that one of the speakers here has been talking about, the fact that there aren't any jobs on the coast, that's really not true. There's... Uh, for example, just Seton Hospital uh, on the coast side has well over 200 employees. We know that just between in the north coast and the unincorporated area has like 1,300 employees. About 1,000 of them live on the other side of uh, the hill, basically, and have to commute into Hapo Bay on a uh, daily basis. But uh, in any case, a, in terms of uh, labor on the coast side, there's actually about a third of the for labor force actually lives in farm labor housing of one sort or another, either on farms or in uh, areas like uh, Moon Ridge. But the other two-thirds have to compete for housing in that area, and that's pretty tough. And some of the things that we've done in trying to help with uh, housing, this board has waived fees for environmental health and our building and planning fees. We've streamlined the farm labor housing permitting process and we've actually put uh, Measure A funding also for farm labor housing for, or a farm labor housing initiative just to give you some of the ideas of some of the things that we've done so far with the rehabilitation and, and replacement. We actually started a pilot uh, project and we rehabbed trailers and replaced a few of the trailers as well. And uh, we're working to bring back, for example, a house that uh, was, you know, turns out to be... It, it had been abandoned, but it looks like, you know, it really is in very good shape. The problem is that we need to make sure that there's adequate water and that it's going to be some significant re rehabbing of that house. And we actually have a whole series of other farmers who are coming to us and trying to work with us in terms of replacing the farm labor housing that's on their site. They really want to improve the housing, and that's one of the things that, you know, really solidifies our workforce. They do not go back and forth. They are not migrants. They pretty much live here year round. Um, they uh, and you know some of the projects that we have done for the children of farm laborers, for example, is Supervisor Groom's uh, big lift is actually out in Puente and and serving those those farm labor communities. So I think we have done or or and are working on to improve farm labor housing. But the fact that we have such a shortage, that's the reason for the decline. There's actually you could grow anything you want on the coast side. Um, and it's uh, it's uh, you know, I, I just really um, am really dedicated to making sure that we preserve our agricultural heritage. And at the same time, 
it really is a food you know security uh, for all of us. And we you know I know we all enjoy uh, organic uh, produce, and it's coming from our coast side, not coming from somewhere else. It's coming from our coast side. So I'm real proud of the work that your office has done, as well as uh, our farm community. You know, I applaud your efforts on the housing issue because that is key um, for us to keep agricultural labor here. Housing is, is a significant deterrent in the cost of housing. So by having available housing for farm, work, farm workers that's affordable, it makes all the difference in, in having a labor workforce here. It is. And I, I know, for example, one of the larger nurseries um, actually employs uh, farm labor. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you call them, but they're people who, who they have a bus and they go down to Salinas and they pick people up and they contract drive labor. Here, contract yes. labor. Yeah. And that is expensive for, not necessarily for the producer, it's expensive for the laborer. For everybody. They end it's up hard having on a, everybody. They have to pay for the ride to and fro. And, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not high income earners. So it's, it's expensive. So the more housing that we can have, the better housing, better quality housing in the long run, um, I think serves all of us well. So thanks for your report. Any other questions? Supervisor Pye? I just had one question concerning the agricultural labor. You noted that 50% of the workforce is actually undocumented. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Um, in, as, as part of the, how, the labor housing survey, the labor survey that was done in preparation for Don's report, um, it's, is uh, um, over 50% of the farm laborers who were interviewed identified as undocumented. And um, nationally, the number is about 57% is undocumented. And um, the, the, the additional breakout, I think, is 33% of them have green cards and 10% are citizens. But um, you know, I, I you know, always think that San Mateo County is going to be different than the rest of the uh, agricultural communities in California and the Western US, but it is not. We have a very high labor, um, undocumented um, numbers of laborers. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I just had a quick question, if I could. I'm curious if the experience in San Mateo County in terms of the worker shortage is true in other counties in California, or is it unique to uh, our coast in San Mateo County? San Mateo County gets, um, is, is harder hit by that because of the cost of living here and that we are a little bit more remote. Um, and we're not as mechanized as some other um, industries are. So. Um, yeah, it, it's San Mateo County's being hit harder than others, and, and similar counties. I can't think of actually anywhere they have the type of ag protection that we have, but also the economy over the hill that we have as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we're we're fairly unique, but it is an issue for all the agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. Just how critical is the question? Thank you for the outstanding report. Thank you, Supervisor Horsley, for all your leadership on this issue. Uh, it's sincerely appreciated. Thank you. We need a motion to accept. I'll make the motion to accept the 2015 San Mateo County Agricultural Crop Report prepared by the Agricultural Commissioner. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, going back for just a second to the action to set the ag agenda, I'm afraid I moved a little too quickly. And um, Supervisor Groom may have wanted to abstain from I did. Uh, one item. Thank you. I'd like to abstain from n number 27. You weren't too quick. I was too slow. <laughs> Thank why, you. why don't you go ahead and make a motion with that amendment then? I'll make a motion to uh, set the agenda and change the consent agenda to, rem to not no, remove it, but. We are going to pull number six and with. Um, pull number six. And I'd and like to abstain from number 27. Set the consent agenda other than item number six? Perfect. No. We'll pull it, not item number six. Yes. And I'll second that. All in favor? I moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Supervisor <coughs> Um Item number two, 130, will uh, move to employee recognition for service uh, awards in room 101. And that brings us to item number three, which is um, acting as the governing board of the 10 county sewer sanitation districts conduct a public hearing. Uh, uh, Mr. Porter. Thank you, President Slocum, members of the board, Mr. Malpe, and Mr. Byers. This uh, PowerPoint up here is actually for the next item. However, I'm going to use one of the maps because it's important that you understand um, part of the action that we're taking today. So um, the item before you is to conduct a public hearing 
and um, after that public hearing, we're recommending approval of setting the sewer service charges for, uh, or excuse me, the sewer service rates for the San Mateo Highlands area, which is the Crystal Springs County Sanitation District, as well as the Burlingame Hills Sewer District, the same as the last fiscal year. And uh, the second item that we're asking you to approve is to direct us uh, to approve a resolution directing uh, staff to file the sewer services charges report. We were before you on June 7th and introduced um, a variety of information regarding uh, the Crystal Springs County Sand District as well as the Burlingame Hills District. Those two districts, uh, we've been setting rates on an annual basis because of the uncertainty of some of the issues that have been involved in those districts. Uh, the Burlingame Hills District was under a Baykeeper consent decree, which required us to perform a variety of capital improvements in that area. Um, so now that we have some certainty in the capital improvements and the costs of those, we're recommending that you hold the rates uh, for that area the same as they were last year. In the case of the Crystal Springs County Sanitary District, uh, that area is uh, part of a cease and desist order that was issued by the Regional Water Quality Control Board along with the city of San Mateo and the town of Hillsboro to try to reduce the amount of sewer overflows that were really occurring uh, within Hillsboro and San Mateo. Uh, that too required substantial capital improvements that the district was involved in, but those costs have become known. And now based on the um, sewer rates that we have last year, we're recommending that they be held the same. The second uh, action that you will be taking today is to uh, direct us to submit the sewer charges report. What that does is essentially provides the mechanism for um, billing our sewer service charges on the tax roll. Uh, the sewer service charges report has calculations within it um, that impact both residential units and other types of property. So the way we bill sewer is per equivalent residential unit. So if you have a single family home, that's one ERU, you receive the uh, fee for one uh, sewer service charge. If for instance, you have a uh, second living unit, that counts as a second uh, ERU and you'll be billed for two. And the charges report basically outlines that for every parcel within the county. So that, uh, that concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Questions? Comments? There being none, could we have a motion to open the public? I'll make the motion to open the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Clerk? Speaker, we have no uh, public comments. For this. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, I'll move to close the public hearing. Thank you. Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I'll move approval of the um, item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Porter, I think you're doing number four also, which is acting as the governing board of county service area number eight. Conduct a public hearing. Thank you, President Slocum. Uh, this item is extremely similar to the last item although this item affects uh, garbage collection in CSA 8, County Service Area 8, which is the North Fair Oaks area. I wanted to talk a little bit more in detail about this because um, there could be a little confusion. The county uh, operates two, two different uh, sewer service areas. One is CSA, or excuse me, garbage service areas. One is CSA 8, which is um, marked as number 7 on your uh, map that you're seeing before you. In CSA 8, we collect garbage fees on the tax roll. For the other uh, nine areas, we operate 10 different unincorporated areas in the South Bayside Waste Management Area. Um, those other nine actually are billed directly by Recology. So we're only talking about uh, CSA 8 in this case. Um, so walking through this, um, we are a member of the South Bayside Waste Management Authority. We're one of 12 members. Recology of San Mateo County provides the garbage collection service. So they're, they're the big trucks you see, they go out and collect everything. South Bay Recycling operates the transfer station in San Carlos. So when all the garbage trucks come in, they, they drop the waste off 
either for processing and uh, hauling up to Ox Mountain in San Mateo County up by Half Moon Bay, or it goes to the uh, material recovery facility, the MRF, where the recycling materials are sorted and then packaged up and sent away as commodities to be used and recycled further. Um, so what we're talking about here is uh, essentially adopting, or you, I'm sorry, your board has already adopted the rates for um, CSA 8, and you did that in February. Um, with the way that the process works for garbage is that every year, Recology develops essentially a revenue requirements report that goes out to the agencies, and they say next year it's going to cost us so much money to provide the service um, to your areas. We then take those revenue requirements and look at how many parcels and how many accounts we have, and then we find out what sort of rates we need to charge to recover those revenues. We went through that in February. What we're doing today is approving the charges report, and similar to sewers, we will take those rates and we run a report, and those, that report then goes uh, to the tax collector's office, and that goes on to their tax bill so that we can recover those rates. Similarly to uh, what we do with sewers, we start out with a, a unit cost. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to go a little bit forward. We start out with a unit cost for each um, service that we provide. In CSA 8, um, the minimum service size in that area is 64 gallons. So that's essentially one unit. You can have a 64 gallon cart or you can have two 32 gallon carts. Uh, and that is for either single family homes or multifamily homes up to four units. When you get above four units, when you get into mixed residential, which could be commercial and residential, or multifamily, which is basically apartments or condos above uh, four units, the rates decline slightly, and that's reflective of um, essentially living in apartments and condos. Um, the size of the dwelling is smaller. So um, what we're asking you to do today is to approve the charges report, or excuse me, conduct a public hearing. After having that public hearing, uh, approve the, or, or direct us to submit the report to um, the tax collecting agencies so that we can recover those revenues. And I hope I didn't confuse anybody, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if I have. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Porter. Questions? I'm Comments? not confused, but I do have a question. Um, <laughs> I might be confused. Um, how do these rates stack up with other rates in, like, the Burlingame Hills or, you know, the individual cities? So I'm sorry that I don't have the chart that compares us with the other cities. We are near the middle, and I... I don't recall if CSA 8, actually, the, um, the service we provide in CSA 8 is 64 gallons. If you look at 64 gallons, we're by far the lowest. Um, but for a 32-gallon rate, which is kind of how we compare to other agencies, we're right about the median point. We're very close to that uh, for this service. And the reason for that and the way that garbage and sewer typically works is um, essentially economies of scale. CSA 8 is densely populated, and the trucks can be very efficient when they run down the roads and collect that garbage. And as such, their time to collect that is less, so the cost per unit can be less. And that's kind of the basis for that. Thank you. Supervisor Pye. Uh, thanks, Mr. Porter. Yeah, I'm a little confused about the difference between what we did on um, February 23rd when you said we adopted the rates. And now we're doing something a little bit different. Right. Could you explain that to me again? So when you adopt the rate, you're essentially setting the sewer service rate, so the cost per can, so to speak. Mm -hmm. For us to collect the revenue, we do that on the tax roll. And we need to submit a report to uh, the tax collection agency to mm -hmm. recover those dollars. So we take the rates that you previously adopted and then run a calculation based on the type of unit that's receiving the service. I see. Okay. So that's, that's really the nuance that uh, it gets confusing. Now, in the other unincorporated areas that are in the South Bay Waste Management Authority territory, those aren't on the tax roll. And I guess, why is that? And also, when did we set the rates for, the, for, the, for those territories? So um, 
To answer your first question, CSA 8 is a longstanding uh, county service area that we've been managing garbage service for some time. That is collected on the tax roll, and I don't know the year that that was um, adopted, but there was some issues with collecting revenues um, from those accounts. So in order to collect those with your property tax, it became easier to collect the revenue by putting it on the tax bill. When uh, the unincorporated county area was established several years ago, 2011, I want to say, um, we chose not to take that route. We chose to allow Recology to do direct billing. It requires less staff time from us uh, to be able to do it that way. And to date, we haven't heard from Recology that they're having trouble collecting uh, the revenue from these areas by direct billing. So that's the reason why there is a difference. It's more of a historic reason. But when we created the new unincorporated county franchised area, we elected to go with direct bill from Recology, and we haven't had a problem yet. Okay, I see. And then when you look at the map, we have other unincorporated pockets that didn't, that I guess aren't in the South, the South Bay side, like for example, West Menlo. They're not, they must be dealt with some other way. They're actually um, uh, five and I, I have a hard time looking at that map. It looks like uh, Sequoia Tract is by Woodside there. Right. It's, Isn't there like, am I, like West Oh, Menlo? I'm sorry. Yeah. So Bayside, I'm sorry, West Bay Sanitary District provides collection for some of those areas. Oh, okay. Uh, and they, you know, we've had discussions with them about taking over their garbage service. The rates uh, didn't come together as closely as we would have liked. I forgot so, about West Bay. Okay. Yeah. And then my last question again is, when did we set the rates for the other, un for all these unincorporated pockets, with the exception of eight? So on an annual basis, Recology provides their uh, revenue requirement report. That uh, typically is actually come to us in draft form at this time. That works on a calendar year. So we try to establish rates by December, January timeframe. In the case of last year, we adopted in February uh, because of some questions that we had about that calculation. But that's why there's a bit of a different lag between garbage and sewer. Garbage is on a calendar year. The sewer rates that you adopted previously, we do that on a fiscal year. So there's a, a bit of a disconnect, and that's because Recology is on a calendar year, and we follow their schedule. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Um, anybody else? Questions? I had, a, I had two questions, actually. Um, if I could, is there, are there advantages or disadvantages, um, or is it even possible to move toward one process for all service areas, areas or is that out of the question? Well, uh, for the uh, unincorporated franchise area, we've done that. Uh, we've incorporated all of the different areas because they're so small and because on the sewer side of the equation, we have had protest hearings for smaller pockets. CSA 8 is a larger area that does lend itself um, to having one area. Um, we could look at, actually um, the Office of Sustainability could look at uh, how combining CSA 8 with these other areas might impact rates for everybody else. But we tend to look at geographic areas. As I mentioned earlier, CSA 8 is a very dense urban area uh, with uh, the properties very closely situated. If you look at the other unincorporated areas, these are basically hilly areas, and they're I a bit it. more expensive to collect because of the difficulty in getting trucks up these windy roads and the separation in the parcels. I spoke a bit earlier about productivity. Um, they're simply less productive in these hilly areas. And I know in some cases, they have to bring smaller trucks to get up these little roads. Mm -hmm. And that comes uh, at a premium. So I think uh, it may be something, uh, if you, we can certainly look at that. I'm not sure if that's gonna be favorable to CSA or no, I not. I understand your answer, thank you. Yeah. And then the last question is on this chart, garbage and recycles, recyclable collection service charges, CSA 8, the last bullet there says additional services are billed directly by Recology. That's correct. Could you give an example of what those additional services might be? Certainly. For instance, if you wanted backyard pickup, uh, that is a separate service that's provided by Recology. We don't include that on the tax roll. If a customer calls up and asks for that, Recology will direct bill them every month for that service. So that, that's a good example of what those are. Thank you. So a motion? To open the public open hearing. The public hearing.
Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. President, we have no public comments. Thank you. I move to close the public hearing. Thank you. Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. 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 Thank you. I'll move to adopt the resolution. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now we'll move on to um, item number five, which is accept a report uh, and direct staff to continue implementing measures to ensure compliance with existing tree regulations while updating these regulations. Mr. Monowitz. Good morning, President Slocum, members of the board, Mr. Maltby and Mr. Byers. I'm pleased to report back to you on the request by Menlo Oaks Tree Advocacy, or MOTA, uh, to adopt an interim oak protection ordinance. Let me start by reviewing the requested ordinance. Um, it would prohibit major trimming or removal of heritage oaks in Menlo Oaks, Her heritage oaks being uh, having a diameter of 48 inches or more at breast height. It allows exceptions to this prohibition only if a tree is in imminent danger of falling and causing damage to life or property is verified by a county selected arborist. And finally, it prohibits land clearing, grading, and stockpiling of materials within the drip line or outer extent of the tree canopy. And the map on the right hand slide, uh, right hand side of this slide, shows the location of uh, Menlo Oaks, which is an unincorporated pocket uh, within Menlo Park just east of Highway 101 between Bay Road and Middlefield. Um, there's about 300 parcels, and trees are a very important part of that community character. And uh, the department shares MOTA's interest in doing our best to protect those trees. So the effect of the requested ordinance um, would be to prohibit removal or major trimming of heritage oaks, which in essence eliminates the planning and buildings department's ability to issue permits for Removal, tree removal or major trimming based on factors such as the general health of the tree, its proximity to existing or proposed structures, and it interference with utility services. Uh, with regard to the proposal to prohibit um, land clearing and stockpiling under existing trees, um, I think that relates to the tree protection requirements that we place during construction. But as worded in the proposed interim ordinance, it's unclear if uh, that's intended to address um, just sites where there is no construction. And the concern there being that that could be a, a new enforcement issue we'd have to deal with in terms of what are people doing below their, the drip line of their existing trees. So I'd like to review um, some of the steps that the Planning and Building Department has taken to be responsive to the concerns about tree removal, throughout, not only in Menlo Oaks, but throughout the county. Um, we've improved and supplemented our tree protection measures that we require during construction. We've begun utilizing independent arborists to help us make informed decisions. We've uh, started applying very significant penalties and using stop work notices to deter unauthorized tree removal. And we've initiated a comprehensive update to our uh, tree protection regulations. So with regard to the tree protection measures, uh, one of the things that we found in um, going out to inspect sites where uh, we require tree protection is that um, Previously, um, we were, would often receive plans that it was unclear where the existing trees were on the site. Um, and so what we've begun to do is require much clearer plans identifying where the trees are on the site so we can ensure that effective tree protection measures are in place. And we confirm that before we allow uh, construction to commence. Um, <clears throat> We've also, uh, as I mentioned, begun using uh, independent arborists. Uh, you might hear more today about a situation at 799 Berkeley, which is one of the instances which I think catalyzed uh, Moda's action. Uh, on that site, we had some um, grading and construction activities that occurred within the drip line of the oak. Um, th that project was stopped, and I can provide more detail about that. But with regard to the arborists, what happened recently was that tree fell, 
and there were allegations that the work that took place beneath the drip line was the cause of that failure. Um, and rather than having the applicant hire an arborist to do a professional evaluation, the county decided we need to do that independently. And so we hired an independent arborist who performed that inspection. So with regard to um, the tools we're using to deter unauthorized removal, uh, pursuant to our fee schedule, we can charge 10 times the regular permit application fee for an after-the-fact permit application. And we can also stop construction. And in the instance at 799 Berkeley, where there were trees removed without the proper permits, uh, that project was put on hold until that issue was effectively resolved. And we worked cooperatively with MOTA in that instance to address tree replanting requirements and tree protection requirements before construction could recommence. And I think that that stop work notice really is a very strong hammer to that encourages um, cooperation from the property owner. Uh, finally, we're in the process of comprehensively updating our significant and heritage tree ordinances. Um, this provides us with an opportunity to incorporate stronger provisions to avoid and avoid and minimize tree removal during development. Um, it also provides us with an opportunity to address uh, tree removal and land management in our rural areas. Uh, as you know, we have uh, invasive tree species that are causing problems in many of our natural areas. And we want to craft a new set of tree removal regulations that really does an effective job of protecting existing native trees that need to remain, but streamlines the process for removing exotic invasives so we can do a better job of restoring our natural habitats. Um, and this is a collaborative stakeholder. We've begun to outreach to uh, various interested parties, and we anticipate that this will be a one-year process during which we will have a lot of back and forth with interested community members regarding the specific provisions of our tree removal regulations. Um, with regard to the extent of the problem, um, I asked my staff to uh, dig some data from our permit tracking system to see um, the amounts of trees that have been removed in Menlo Oaks over the past five years. Uh, I won't go through all these figures here. I think one of the important ones is that over the past five years, there have been three permits to remove heritage trees. So. Um, you know, I think that uh, the focus on heritage trees maybe does not um, hit the target in terms of trying to increase our ability to um, minimize tree removal because heritage trees, uh, removal of that occurs very infrequently in our opinion. So um, in conclusion, uh, let me once again say that we support MOTA's efforts to increase tree protection in Menlo Oaks. And we look forward to working with them to do that through the comprehensive update to our tree regulations. Um, and in response to their allegations that uh, they feel that in the past our permitting process has been like a rubber stamp, I would have to say that you know at this point in time I would strongly disagree with that assertion. Um, I've made it clear to my staff and put procedures in place that um, we really need to pay careful attention to any tree removal um, proposals in Menlo Oaks and do a, a thorough job of enforcing uh, both our permit requirements and tree protection measures. Um, those procedures are in place and seem to be uh, making a difference. So uh, with that, I'll close my presentation and welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Monowitz. Questions? Su Supervisor Horsley, do you? Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, um, that I see, and not only this area, but other areas as well, is oftentimes, a, a property gets bought, and uh, they cut the tree down. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, we can charge them ten times the fee for the after the fact, but the tree's cut down. Um, would an interim or urgency stop that? 
I think the, the fact that uh, trees get cut without the proper permits is a situation that uh, the proposed interim ordinance wouldn't stop. Um, you know, I, I think our, our strategy for trying to address that is not only through um, stronger penalties, but also um, by um, having clearer tree replacement requirements. So in the instance that a tree is illegally removed, um, the fines and the replacement requirements will um, offset those impacts to the degree possible. But once a you know hundred year old or more tree is removed, it's is very hard to replace without a doubt. But. That's true. Uh, one of the things I know is that you're using an independent uh, arborist on some occasions, but could we not use one in all occasions? Like for all the th things that have been removed, um, health hazards. I assume every one of those somebody hired an arborist and unfortunately you probably can get an arborist to say whatever you want as long as you're paying them but could we not uh, on those occasions get a an independent analysis i don't know if you have the ability to do that or if we should add that in your budget or uh that it is our intent and what i've been doing is using the monies that are collected through our after the fact permitting process and placing that into an account that can be used to then pay for arborist services. So um, uh, at this point, I believe we have adequate money within our budget to provide independent arborist review, and that's our intent. Could you have done it on all 89 of those uh, tree removals? Yes, I mean, that was over the course of um, five years. Oh, so, okay. so yeah, I, I believe um, that would not be problematic. Thanks. Supervisor Crew. Mr. Monowitz, um, can you tell me the, what the amount of penalties are? Sure. So as I mentioned, um, for an after-the-fact uh, tree removal permit, we charge 10 times our regular permit fee. Um, for a heritage tree removal permit, it's uh, $451 per tree. Okay, that's the standard price. And so uh, 10 times that would be the penalty for $4,500 4, for removing one heritage tree. And that doesn't account for the cost associated with replacement requirements. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't account for the cost of stopping a project, which if construction is underway, we will stop it. And the time period that's lost during that period can be quite expensive for developers. <laughs> You know what? I, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing us raise that if we're going to do a new amend our heritage tree. I wouldn't mind, you know, really making that so sig significant that that people will think twice because you can probably by c taking a tree out illegally, you can probably save yourself that amount of money on something else. And I think this was the the worry about this the, uh, this particular neighborhood, and it's the, I think worry about other neighborhoods is that the tree is taken out in the dark of night, and um, obviously we don't have any enforcement. And sometimes you sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know. So I think we should do whatever we can to make this fee um, and the accountability level so high that people will not come and take out trees, but we'll go through the proper procedures. And that's that's just the, the biggest worry. When I was on the San Mateo City Council, we had some trees removed illegally, and we actually took the people to court, and we did not, we were not successful in court. And so some, we started upping fees because at least there is some sense of, of, of worry and responsibility on the amount of money that's going to cost. Um, I My second thought was, do we need a staff arborist instead of you having to have on call folks so that uh, if immediately we can have an arborist on site if necessary i mean I, that would be a recommendation that i would make in, if we if, as we update this ordinance i think this is a, you know clearly a severe serious problem um, the entire county is is a beautiful for the most part, has beautiful trees in it, and I and I don't care what the neighborhood is. We don't want to lose trees, and we don't want to lose tr we lose trees in, for the sake of construction. And so, whatever we can do to make this, I, I'm, I'm I was actually in favor of an emergency ordinance. But if you think your material will strengthen that, and I'd like to see some more strengthening to it, then I think we 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 could perhaps work on that and see how it goes for the next several months. 
Th thanks, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. There'll be, be one more. In terms of the arborist, one of the reasons that I, I support Supervisor Grimm's uh, recommendation for an arborist because um, you know if you're contracted with somebody, they also contract with yeah. builders, and so. Uh, I want somebody that I am assured is independent, that'll give me the best information as opposed to, well, today I'm working for you, tomorrow I'm working for a contractor, so I don't know if they want, you know. And so I, I think I'm, I'm in favor of having a, um, a staff person that it's actually an actual qualified arborist. Uh, Mr. President, um, let us look at that as a final budget issue, and it may be possible, depending on departmental needs, to actually share a position like that between parks and, and, and planning. So let us talk to both departments and see what their needs are and bring a recommendation Thank back you. to you in September. Thank you. <laughs> Super Supervisor Tissier. Uh, just a quick question. Did, did I understand you to say the way you enforce the fines is through stopping the job? Oh, that's part of it. Um, okay. you, we, we have situations, <clears throat> excuse me, where there is no job associated with the tree removal. So that tool isn't available to us if there's no active construction and a tree is removed. But if there is active construct construction and a tree is illegally removed, we will stop the project. Okay. The reason I was asking that question specific is so if you find someone that there's no project associated, how do you enforce the collection? So we do that by um, requiring them to come in for an after-the-fact permit. Um, and through that process, we charge the 10 times the application fee. And then we also, through the action on the after-the-fact application, decide on replacement requirements to make up for the loss of that tree. Um, I haven't uh, personally experienced a situation where somebody refused to come back to come in for an after the fact permit, but uh, we have legal remedies to address those types of situations should they occur. Okay, because that's one of the things I, I'm just assuming if it's a property owner, we have the ability to lien the property if they choose to not come back. <coughs> in. I mean, I think, I think as Carol had mentioned, I think you need to make it very serious and it, people need to understand that. So I just want to make sure there is a remedy if they don't come in because I imagine as the dollars go up, you know, some people might not bother to come in, you know, so we need to be able to lean the property. Agree. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Pye. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple couple points and questions. Um, so when you, you had the slide showing the trees that had been removed and, uh, it, you know, of the 152, 149 were significant trees. And it's a significant tree, just, uh, just, just somewhat smaller tree than a heritage tree or I'm not quite sure what the definition of that yeah, is. Yeah, that's correct. Um, heritage is 46-inch diameter at breast height. Uh, significant is 38-inch at breast height, although there are some variations depending on the type of tree spelled out in our regulations. All right, so those, they're still pretty big, good-sized trees. Um, yeah, I do think that the fines um, need to be increased. You know, I, I was really struck by a story I saw it about the situation in Woodside where a developer was fined $212,000 because uh, of tree removal. And the way they did it there, uh, it was the first tree was 5,000, the second tree was 7,500, the third tree was 10. Um, so at least there's certain precedent in Woodside for much higher, higher fines. And you know, as, as my colleagues have said, once the tree is down, you know, we're in a, that's a big problem. You can't, 100 year trees, can't replace it. I mean, what's the value of that? So that clearly has to change. You know, on the arborist, you know, so today when an arborist is required, do we have the ability to um, hire our own arborist and bill the applicant? Or is that how it works? I got, this, I got the sense that you were trying to find money to hire arborists and pay for it with county funds. That's what you seem to be saying. Right. Um, currently, uh, we are using the fines we're collecting to pay for the arborist services. Um, Why can't I, we can't bill the applicant? Oh, I think we can. I, I think um, we we need to look at how to put those procedures in place. But I, I think that is certainly an option that we can pursue. But it doesn't sound like we have the legal right to do that today. Is I I don't believe so. We'd have to ask counsel. But it's not within our regulations or within our fee schedule to do that currently. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the independence of the arborist is critical, yes. and you know, the staff, staff, um, arborist, uh, you know, probably is probably is a good idea. I, I think in Palo Alto, if I remember, they they 
they're required to hire arborists that do not work. They, they somehow define it so that they're, they're, they don't ever cut trees down. The consulting arborist. Yeah. So, so yeah. you know, I don't know if that, mm-hmm. how the, those two compare, but the independence of the arborist is, is critical. And then I guess finally, I guess uh, I, I see you know, your request is to take uh, about a year to put together this ordinance. I mean, there are certain things we've identified today that are pretty straightforward, like increase the fines, independent arborist, um, those two anyways. I mean, would it make sense to just, do, I can see why you wouldn't want to just verbatim take the ordinance proposed by the public, but you know, another alternative would be to do something kind of quick and dirty that it c- covers some of these big points. Um, what, what would you think of that idea? I, I'm certainly open to it. I, I think that um, we could, um, as part of our comprehensive update, take a look at some of the critical uh, points that you've mentioned, and then maybe there's a couple others, and kind of fast track a first phase of that, bring that to you, and then complete the more uh, um, in-depth changes, particularly as it relates to our rural areas um, at a later date. So um, I'd be happy like, to yeah, pursue some of the pursue some that. of these the, some of the points have identified. Fat, sooner the better. Yeah. Mr. 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 Chair, could I add one? Yeah. I I don't. Th- I really think we ought to hire an arborist uh, as opposed to a, a revolving sol- process of, of of arborists. I don't think there's enough arborists around in this county so that they could be independent. Um, you know, the big firms you use, you see their trucks all over, and there's, you know, half a dozen of the bigger firms that seem to be on every job. So I just don't think that we would have that independence, where if we hire our own, he has to follow our rules because he works for us. Mm-hmm. She does. She does. <laughs> she does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Monowitz, I had a couple of questions. Certainly. Clarifications. In the, in the memo, it says these penalty fees are being applied on a regular basis. That's under the section measures to deter unauthorized tree removal. Mm-hmm. And then in the, file, in the next paragraph, it says stop work notices are being issued. Um, do you have a, the total number of penalty fees that have been collected this, this year, for instance? Um, not off the top of my head. Um, I... Um, estimate that we've had um, th- three instances this year where um, we have applied the 10 times uh, the permit fee. Um, that 10 times the permit fee has been on our f- fee schedule for some time. There was some history about our ability to enforce that, um, and we resolved those issues earlier this year so that we could begin using that again. So this is really the first year that we've been applying that since I've been the director. Thank you. And stop work notices, do you happen to know how many of those? Um, I know at least two instances least where two. we stopped work. Because Both in there the was, Menlo Oaks area? Um, one in the Menlo Oaks and uh, one in the Emerald Lake Hills area. Hmm. OK, thank you. Um, what about the idea of I don't know how this would work. You could certainly speak to it, but um, finding the tree companies that Supervisor Groom mentioned. Um, so I'm assuming what happens is if you have a, a large tree, you call one of these tree services and they come in, and take it down if that's what the customer requested. But uh, what about the notion of you know penalizing them for after some amount of outreach? Uh, on this topic to get their attention, let's say. I I certainly think the idea has merit. Um, Our practice has been to hold property owners responsible for the activities that occur on their property. Mm -hmm. So currently the penalties are applied to the property owner. I'd have to consult with counsel as to our ability to uh, also find the um, the, uh, entity that cut the tree, but um, we can certainly look at that as part of our update. Yeah, uh, and President Slocum, we'd be, it's a very creative idea, and uh, you know, I'm sort of processing it as, as, uh, as I speak here. I, I do think it's something we can, uh, we can address. I mean, our police power is very broad, as you know, the police power of a, of a 
of a public agency. Um, we kind of need to think through some of the legal issues, but it, it is a creative, creative idea, and it's worth uh, probably worth exploring. Thank you. Just two other th quick things. Um, I wasn't quite clear on where we are leaving the conversation about the emergency ordinance or bifurcating um, the two sort of uh, process areas. Could you just review that for a moment? Sure. Um, I, I think based on uh, the feedback that we've received this morning, um, what my intent is to uh, regroup with my staff and figure out um, what portions of the tree regulation update can be fast-tracked to address things like uh, penalties um, and fines um, and to bring that back to you um, as quickly as we can um, I would say a three to four month month period is about what we would need to have something to for you to act upon and then to bring back the uh, supplemental components of the update at a later date so um, and that would in essence um, uh, supersede the need for an interim urgency ordinance. Okay. So you think three months is? I'd say three to four months, days. yes. Do, do we know how many projects might be in the pipeline that could be affected in the next three to four months without more yeah, stringent thank you. restrictions? Um, I, I don't believe there are many, um, but I would have to go back and check. I'm looking at our building official, and uh, he doesn't seem to know the answer to that question at this point either. So, um, But I, I will... Uh, certainly be closely monitoring the situation in Menlo Oaks and in the instance that we feel that we need to push that forward more quickly, we will do so. I thought I saw somebody in the audience hold up four fingers. I'm not sure my glasses are sort of for reading, but if there were four, if that's true, are there things that could be done addressing Supervisor Groom's uh, point? Well, I. Uh, as I went through the procedures that we are currently implementing, um, you know, being rigorous about making sure that the projects that are in the pipeline adequately document the trees that are on site, adequately install tree protection measures prior to commencing construction, maintain those throughout the construction process, we will absolutely be implementing those, um, and we already are. Just, could I just ask one more thing? Sure. Sorry. Um, the, You're the president. You can do, you do anything you want. want. Oh, I was just being polite. <laughs> um, the, the, the difference between the heritage tree and I think you called it significant tree. Yes. One was 38 inches, one was 44 inches. Does it make any, or, yeah, does it make any sense to just somehow put those together? I mean, I don't know. It, the difference between 38 and 44 seems... Yes, uh, that is our intent. As part of the updates, we intend to consolidate the significant tree regulations, the heritage tree regulations, in one package of regulations. Right. And actually, right. I, I would like to see the size come down because 48 inches is really a very large yeah. tree. And I Thank think um, we could do a better job of protecting some of the important ones that don't meet that threshold. Thank you. I do like Mr. Malpe's suggestion of possibly looking at combining the arbalist position with the planning as well as the uh, parks department. I think that's an idea worth pursuing. Um, and then I th think Supervisor Tissier wanted to uh, just, ask just a question. Just a quick question. When you're talking about permitting trees, is it just the significant in the heritage or any trees that get cut down through development or just in general in our unincorporated areas? Uh, our tree regulations only apply to the heritage trees tree and to the significant tree. Uh, so trees that do not meet the significant tree threshold are not protected. However, we do have land clearing requirements. So if somebody uh, uh, goes out and grades and removes a whole stand of trees that may not meet the significant or heritage threshold, we have some ability to address a land clearing issue but a single tree that does not meet the significance threshold is not protected by our current regulations I was the reason I asked that question is it sort of plays on what uh, our president commented on you know when you do construction in your house the contractor has to pull permits from the city or in this case has pulled permits from the county. why wouldn't we have the contractor who's cutting down trees be required to pull a permit to remove a significant or heritage tree because if you're going to make them responsible, make them be the ones that have to pull the permit. They're less likely to cut something down if, if they go see what kind of tree it is. If that's an ordinance, we have to make sure we let them all know. But they're a contractor as well. So, uh, you know. 
So, so we, the, we, we place the permit requirements and the obligations to fulfill those permit requirements on the property owner. Extending that to the contractor, as we talked before, is something that we will certainly look into. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Groom? I, I think that's what we did in the city of San Mateo, is the contractor had to get the permit to remove the tree, I think. Um, also, I want to ask a, a question, since it's close to budget time again. Do you have enough enforcement? I mean, if you get a call that it looks like somebody's coming to remove a tree, can you send somebody in half an hour? I mean, do you have enough staff? Yes, I believe we do. Okay. All right. I mean, um, half an hour is a tall order if it, it's a way out on the coast side. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we have staff out there on a regular basis, and um, we can um, – I mean, typically when, when, respond when, within when the Minlo hours. Oaks people first came to us I mean they had it well documented with photographs and um, so that you could see immediately that there was a, a, a serious problem but um, I don't know if other neighborhoods are quite as quite as organized and so uh, I just wouldn't want to make sure that if it looks like the truck is pulling up that we should have somebody out there to stop it if we can yes agreed we also have um, collaborated with the sheriff's department. You mentioned earlier uh, trees being taken down in the dark at night. So when we don't have enforcement staff on duty, we do coordinate with the sheriff's department. Thank you, Mr. Monowitz. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Monowitz. Other comments and questions or questions? Um, so, Mr. Monowitz, we really, I mean, it's clear that you're really, you want to want to improve the situation you're, and you're very focused on it. Um, I guess I just come back, though, and ask a little bit about the timeline for the well, I guess for this, maybe we'll call it the interim ordinance as opposed to the emergency ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we're just going to kind of fo focus in on three or four key points that have been identified today, like the size of the tree, the fines, um, that it has to be either our arborist or until such time as we have our own arborist, it should be an independent arborist, a couple of key points like that. I mean, couldn't, couldn't it come back within, like, say, 60 days or something like that? I mean, again, we're, if it's really just a kind of hit a couple of these key points. I mean, uh, I mean, certainly I appreciate the, and uh, some of the things may be more, there's a lot and more nuance that will take a lot of time, but that would be my, I guess my, my request, my, my question to you. Sure. Uh, our plan had been to um, run this through the planning commission first prior to coming to the board, but um, I know that is required when we're amending our zoning in our general plan uh, in this case. Longer, yeah. In this case, the tree regulations are outside of our zoning and um, perhaps can not go to the planning commission and come directly to the board if that's your desire. I think that's an important uh, question for us to answer in, in order to determine timing. Um, but uh, yes, I, I think that if we didn't go to the planning commission that um, it would be reasonable to try and have something before you in the next two months. Supervisor Horsley. Just uh, just one enforcement issue is that, you know, you, w w it's fine during the week. And, and I'm thinking about the, but you, know, you do hear change laws on Saturdays. So somehow having a better coordination with the sheriff's department to for have, you know, have them take a greater responsibility. I'm, I just know that, uh, you know, I get reports on, for example, of like people, you know, the, they can hear the chainsaws going on a Saturday and tree's gone. Mm -hmm. So if we could um, get the sheriff's act, sheriff's barn be somewhat more active. I know they don't really like to do code enforcement, but at least they can go out and stop the process. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor. Other comments, questions? Okay, a motion on item number five. Mr. Um, Mr. President, we sorry. do have. I'm sorry. Just Public comment. Yes. I'm sorry. It's okay. We have uh, six speakers. Thank you. Uh, the first one is Judy Hurst, followed by Ann Courtlander. Hi, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. And um, I really love the discussion that you all just had. And I want to applaud Steve and his department for stepping up to incorporate some of the ideas that we discussed with him over the many meetings we've had with planners and, uh, and the building department. Um, I was going to read through, I've provided documentation, but I'm going to cut this short a little bit for your pleasure and uh, want to say that uh, the uh, two points, the heart of our 
urgency uh, moratorium is to prevent the trees from being removed or severely pruned without a thoughtful process that truly considers not only potential risk but also the benefits of these trees and how they provide those benefits to us. And I think you're getting at that in this discussion, and I really appreciate uh, what you've said. The other area that I feel probably is the reason there should be uh, an enactment of this ordinance is because there's a lot of supervision and process that's been talked about here today. And um, at the heart of this matter, it would be, it would seem that if you're implementing new procedures and that building inspectors are going to stay on top of this process, how is that going to happen? How is that going to happen right now? If we took 45 days to get that in, into place, we could maybe stop some egregious things from happening in the interim. And as Steve even said, it's going to take some time to do this. We're happy to work with him in any way we can and continue to work with you because we've found that there is a good response to what we're doing. But we feel like um, it's our, been our experience that there are too few staff members available or trained on how to stay on top of the heritage, heritage and, I'm glad to say, significant tree-related issues. The staff at the desk is always gracious and courteous, but they, has it been two minutes already? <laughs> But they, but they actually um, don't have, they're unable to impact anything at that point at the desk. So um, an example of how backed up the department is, is when it comes to tree-related matters that the planning department has been a unable to bring a response to the Board of Supervisors related to the Planning Commission's denial in January of this year of a tree removal request by a developer that was then appealed by us to the, uh, or appealed to the board, not by us, but by a surrogate for the developer. We were the ones that opposed the permit at the planning commission. The matter is only now just coming before the board, I hope next month, it's been eight months, it will be eight months. So meanwhile, we have filed more complaints on that particular property in the interim of eight months, and we don't see that anything's been done to improve the health, the wellness, the safety of those trees. And um, it seems like we believe the order for these um, uh, new directions that he's describing um, and in his recommendation can be effective. It's critical to have the process, the procedures, interdepartment coordination, accountability, Thank enforcement, and training in place. Thank you. Thank you. I, d I didn't know that was my time. I thought I had two minutes. <laughs> you did have two minutes. Okay, anyway. You over two minutes. Thank you, one and all. And uh, please uh, grant us this 45 day moratorium. Thank you. We have Anne Cortlander, followed by Mark Fall. Thank you for your interest in this matter. Uh, I'm a process person, and uh, like Judy, I wanted to emphasize the fact that the staff in planning and building is just, they're smart, they're gracious, they try to be helpful. But we found, especially with this project at 799, that some of them had lack of basic knowledge of where tree protection in a building plan might be found. They didn't know what standard tree protection was. When asked, and this is both the counter staff and building as well as a lack of knowledge over on the planning side and the counter staff. It's kind of like playing whack-a-mole when you go in, in terms of people trying to help you, but you get pushed from place to place, and often you feel it's an ad hoc special request on their part to help you maybe send someone out and maybe something happens. I mean, this, this project at 799 was just a catalog of errors on the developer's part, and the developer seemed to know exactly where all the weak points in knowledge and process within the department was. So from my perspective, I think that I'd like to see the 45 days taken to understand exactly how these specific processes that Steve's talking about are going to be implemented. There's not going to be any more budget or people probably in the short term. So it's going to take a lot of interdepartmental cooperation, coordination, and training then with staff and actually educational materials perhaps for the public. So 
Besides extending this urgency ordinance to significant trees, I'd like to see you pass it simply so that we can have Steve come back with more specifics around process and education and training for the staff and how this is all going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mark Fole, followed by Marilyn Wong. I'm Mark Fowl. I live at 930 Colby Avenue in Menlo Oaks, and my backyard abuts the 799 property. So I've become very interested in the process, and I've gotten to know the folks in our Mota Tree Organization in the Menlo Oaks area. Uh, also would like to thank you for your understanding. Today I've become very, very um, enthused about the fact that you people understand what the issue is that we're facing. Uh, I am here because I wish to encourage you uh, to adopt the urgency ordinance. Um, I think a 45-day time frame, in my opinion, is something not knowing what our alternatives are that at least gives some highlight to the fact that we are going to give attention to this in the short term. Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn Wong, followed by Janet Wiseman Goff. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm actually speaking on behalf of myself last, but for I'm going to be reading something that Aaron and Jeff uh, Glanville, homeowners um, at 631 Menlo Oaks Drive, have written because they couldn't be here. The removal of an oak tree should be the absolutely last option. It should occur only after every measure to keep these majestic trees, which are supposed to have the protection under a heritage status, alive. Unfortunately, eventually oak trees reach an end of life, many of which has been impacted by the drought and must be taken down. That should be the exception, not the rule. The unfortunate unwritten rule that has been understood by developers is that they can simply file paperwork claiming a tree is diseased, pay an arborist to agree, pay a small fee, and have a tree removed in no time. They can build a house right up to the heritage oak tree and then claim the tree is too close to the house. They can grind down the tree roots, put in a landscape, hardscape, and later claim the tree is damaged when they are the ones who have damaged it. They can have the tree removed in order to put in a pool when they have almost a quarter of an acre of other backyard land where the pool could have been located. These majestic trees need protection. And I'd like to speak for myself now. Um, I live in the beautiful area of Menlo Oaks. I've been a resident there for 34 years. And I have several heritage oaks on my property. I had a friend uh, that picked me up to go someplace on Sunday, and he is from Oakless, Oakland. <laughs> Used to have oaks. <laughs> and he was remarking on the beauty of this area and all the trees that we have. And uh, I can see that you appreciate that too, two people. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to leave you with um, a book that Dr. Seuss wrote. I know you may know it. If you don't know it, you should read it. Your kids should read it, and so should your grandkids. It's called The Lorax. And um, The Lorax uh, was it, took place in an area much like Menlo Oaks, and there were beautiful, beautiful truffula trees that grew there. And someone came in and decided to cut, start cutting the truffula trees down to make sneeds that nobody needs. And pretty soon, there were no more truffula trees and no more swami swams that could sing in those trees. And when the last one was cut down, the Lorax stood at the top of his uh, overseeing and he held in his hand the last truffula seed and he threw it down to a little boy. And he said, plant this and maybe, maybe the truffula trees will grow back and those swami birds will come sing again. I thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next is Janet Wiseman Goff, followed by Lenny Roberts. Come with us. Oh, 
Excuse me. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Hi, I want to start by thanking you so much for the thoughtful questions and discussion that I heard here this morning. It actually lifts my heart uh, that this is being discussed um, in a, a very um, thorough way. Uh, we on uh, the Menlo Oaks Tree Advocacy have been at this for two years, and it's not only the property on Berkeley uh, that's been a, a natural disaster. It is also a property on Menlo Oaks uh, that Marilyn um, read the uh, statement from the neighbors on. Um, we, uh, since 2014, um, we've been trying to slow um, and eliminate the destruction of trees that's ongoing in our neighborhood. Um, and um, it, this urgency ordinance may not uh, seem urgent to the folks in planning, but it is definitely urgent to the people who live in Menlo Oaks. Um, and 45 days is not very much to allow to make sure that we have some plan in place that is actually going to work to protect these trees. Um, we started by trying to partner with the planning department and be their eyes and ears on the ground. And we got, as Ann said, a kind of a whack-a-mole thing where, you know, planning was like, well, we're done with our part now, so you have to talk to building. And building was like, no, trees aren't our business. You have to talk to planning. And planning's like, well, talk to the compliance officer. And, you know, and, and we went around and around until we finally elevated it up to a meeting with Steve Monowitz in um, – his, uh, some of his representatives who are working on the tree ordinance back in um, 2015. Um, unfortunately, since that meeting, nothing has changed, nothing. And the first time we saw any traction was when you guys were kind enough to meet with us individually. And when we were presenting pictures and information to you, we started to feel at least some response from somebody. And it, but it wasn't really until um, Supervisor Slocum picked up the phone and called Steve Monowitz and said, what is happening at 799 Berkeley, that a stop work order was, um, was given on that property. And that's two years worth of working for us. So when we ask for uh, an emergency um, interim order, it is that it's for the interim, because these things take time. There's a lot that goes into them, and we understand that. So instead of trying to push forward and make the ordinance happen in a, 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 a too short a period of time, we need protection Thank now. You. Thank you. So there's also an illustration of another property that was recently sold. It is definitely going to – it's it's <coughs> zoned for 9,000 square feet of building, and it has – absolutely humongous redwood trees on it, humongous there. One of them is, I think, 45 feet in diameter. Thank so you. please help us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Our last speaker is uh, Ms. Lenny Roberts. Good morning, and I just want to say thank you, all of, all of the Board of Supervisors and planning staff. Um, for your interest and, and your concern about the situation, particularly in Menlo Oaks, but it isn't limited there. Mm -hmm. And so I think this has really been a very productive discussion that you've had today, and I see things are moving ahead um, even without an urgency ordinance at this point. So I know you'd have to have an urgency ordinance brought back to you in order to start it. So um, you're already starting today, which is, to me, very... Um, encouraging. Um, I had a number of things to say about why you need, you still need to um, do more than what um, Steve brought to you this morning. I really appreciate all the all the effort the planning staff has already put into this. Um, it's very unfortunate that in Menlo Oaks, the burden has really been on the citizens to look out for their trees and. You know, it's it's all of our responsibility, obviously, as a community to care about these um, incredible assets. But um, mm -hmm. I really feel like everybody seems to be pulling together, particularly in Menlo Oaks, about um, addressing the problem. Uh, with respect to the Woodside Town Council, um, this they uh, they did find this owner uh, who had only owned the property for a year and then sold it. Uh, he 
clear, he cut uh, trees for a driveway and a house site and then sold it. Um, he paid the $212,000. It, it was minor compared to what he was making from just doing that one thing. So the cost of doing business uh, in our, under our 10 times the permit fee is you know, minuscule, really. So thank you, Carol, for um, uh, asking for a, a stronger set of um, uh, remedies when somebody does this. Hope, hopefully a deterrent would, would actually work. Um, the final thing is that I think it's super important to have an arborist, an independent arborist, because um, my own experience has been when we had to cut, cut down a, a tree that was being um, had been an exotic tree in our backyard, Chinese evergreen elm, uh, and we had an oak tree that was getting bigger and we wanted to favor that. The, uh, we did apply for the right permit and the planning staff that came out, I had to point out to the staff person which was the tree that was this exotic tree that needed to come out. So. Um, <laughs> So not everybody has trees as their primary <coughs> interest in the planning and building department. Certainly building department doesn't even think they need to worry about trees. So <coughs> we really need an arborist who can um, be independent and act on behalf of the county and the, and the trees that you're protecting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, if I can just yep. jump in uh, real, real briefly. I, of course, the board could direct staff to bring back an in interim uh, urgency ordinance, but um, but to the extent the board is, is still uh, um, still has a desire to uh, to see an amended significant and heritage tree ordinance, um, I uh, I can certainly commit the resources of, of our office uh, to work very closely with Steve and his department to to bring something back as expeditiously as possible. We will, we will need a little bit of time just to, um, based on some of the comments here today, to, to perhaps look at maybe the best practices of other jurisdictions, such as maybe the town of Woodside or the city of San Mateo. Those jurisdictions that have, um, have I guess, uh, regulations that are um, perhaps on the, um, have really strong tree protection you know, regulations. We, we want to Take a look at some of those jurisdictions and maybe sort of borrow some of the place in their playbook, but that shouldn't take that shouldn't take a whole lot of time. And um, and there's I think it, this can be done relatively quickly. I'm I'm thinking you know we should be able to get something before you September. You only have one more board meeting. You have one board meeting in August, and then mm -hmm. and then uh, and then it's September. So I'm I'm hopeful that we could shoot for September. <coughs> Steve Regan's shaking his head yes. Oh. If that's still the desire of the board. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Byers. One of those September meetings is budget. So we would only we would only have really one meeting in September to deal with this. Uh, through the president, uh, Supervisor Groom is right. Although you certainly could address this on that meeting, should you choose to do so. so I'm I'm a little confused now. Maybe Mr. Fox. I'm not sure who wants to answer this, but there's an emergency ordinance, but what about the notion of the 45 day? Just more emergency moratorium, similar to what we did on the on the mobile home park uh, moratorium. Is that an option for us to consider here today? It is an option for you to consider. Um, there really uh, the, the idea of an emergency uh, ordinance, an emergency zoning ordinance is that it, it's an alternative path for uh, avoidance of the usual noticing requirements that are required when the board adopts um, uh, zoning regulations. So there's the ordinary ordinance gate, and I think the board is very familiar with the first and second reading process that's done for most ordinances adopted by the board. But there's a much more elaborate process for zoning ordinance to be vetted and aligned with the general plan. There are required hearings before the planning commission, and then it's brought to the board of supervisors at the end of that process. The um, emergency procedures exist as an exception to that rule, but they require that certain findings be made that the board is considering adoption of a zoning ordinance that meets certain criteria that are established by the government code. So generally, it's, it's good to think of that emergency ordinance as being an exception to the usual process of adopting a new zoning ordinance that changes the use of properties in, in particular areas. Um, there are uh, some potential concerns about whether or not a, um, a, an ordinance of this nature really qualifies for that language in the government code. Um, our original heritage and significant tree ordinances were adopted under the first and second reading um, 
model, to my understanding. That's the process that the board went through to adopt those ordinances um, because they are not, in some sense, zoning ordinances. They are ordinances that apply uh, throughout the county regardless of zoning district. So um, if it were the board's interest to adopt something as soon as possible, you have two options available to you. One is to go with the uh, emergency ordinance procedure and bear uh, the legal risk that might come with that. The other is to go through a first, second reading process with an ordinance brought to you by um, the department and recommended by the department on a fast track model as described by Mr. Byers. Thank you. Supervisor Groom. Well, it, so it, it sounds like a fast track ordinance is about the same amount of time now as in a 45 day emergency ordinance. If we, if, if everybody goes to, if we get this done starting today or whenever, but so, I mean, I really did think we needed an emergency ordinance, but based on Mr. Fox's description, I think that we could go with asking them to develop an ordinance as soon as possible and be able to, can we, can we legally implement some of the protection measures that we've talked about without having an ordinance? I mean, can we take it in, in the existing ordinance that we have now? So we did take a close look at what Mr. Monowitz uh, presented in his report about measures that he's undertaken, and we're confident that the actions that the department is currently taking under the current ordinance are authorized by our existing legal authority. There are additional things such as the um, responsibility of contractors and, and potentially increasing the fines that would, would definitely require ordinance amendments. But okay. the stuff that's being done immediately is being done under good legal authority. Thanks, Mr. Fox. So I, I then I, I would make a motion that we... Um, accept Mr. Monowitz's report today, and he and his staff will go to work to incorporate the things that have been discussed in, 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 in amending our existing ordinance and fast track it. And I would second that uh, motion. But also, just a quick question. The, one of the things that seems to be a kind of a precipitating cause here was the 799 Berkeley. Yeah. Even if we did an urgency ordinance, it probably wouldn't affect it anyway, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Okay, there's been a motion and a second, I believe. And I, I just maybe just, I, I support the motion. And I, I guess one thing I just want to be clear on is do we think that the ordinance that comes back will kind of do it? Or do you think we're going to then have to have more public outreach and work on it again? Which I would be fine with. But. Yeah, I would too. But I, I think that, I think that the, the, we made a a series of points right, that we right. think will will help and the, neighbor, the neighborhood there. seems to think that that will help yeah. so and we can you know if 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 it if it turns out not to be exactly right we'll modify start it. it over modify it yeah yeah i would guess yeah i think i think that's actually right and when the staff brings that ordinance to us if they could if there's things they think they want to work on to take longer they should identify those yeah just one other question. Mr. Mulby, <clears throat> that idea to um, look at the arbalist to support two departments, would that qualify for an agile situation, thereby it yes, could, could. could be done sooner? Uh, it, it could. Let us take a look at that and see. Um, I, I think we will bring it back on the uh, September 20th, um, and we'll make a recommendation whether it should be permanent classified or, okay. for, or agile. agile. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so there's been a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you all. Thank you. you want to take a break? All right. We're going to take a short five-minute break, if that's okay with everybody. Thank you. Okay, we're back. So I believe we're on item number seven, the county manager's report, number 15. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, several items on my report today. Uh, the first uh, involves the uh, merger of the Daly City uh, Police uh, Dispatch Operations with the county. Um, the original uh, merger date was anticipated to be October. However, due to staffing shortages in Daly City, the county has agreed to, um, uh, to begin dispatching on uh, weekends and beginning in August uh, in the evenings and then the full dispatch uh, will be cut over in October. So we already are dispatching for Red Daily City in order to help them out in the interim. 
Um, regarding um, the East Palo Alto SWAG grant, I'm pleased to announce that Paul Council uh, has been hired uh, as a half-time management analyst to work in that program. Uh, Paul comes to us from uh, the city of San Mateo with a very impressive uh, background and look forward to his work uh, with the city of East Palo Alto. Uh, let you know that um, the uh, uh, county uh, uh, Department of Child Support Services, in anticipation of the uh, Child Support Awareness Month in August, has um, uh, filmed uh, commercials in the county government center uh, regarding its services and the importance of um, uh, parents uh, raising a child uh, and the involvement in children's lives beyond simply uh, paying or receiving uh, child support. Um, uh, this month, the uh, new California law regarding the um, uh, inventory uh, for uh, all the open uh, data information and that uh, governments have online went into effect. Uh, the county worked very closely uh, with the uh, urban counties, um, with Senator Hertzberg, in order to develop the language for that um, uh, that law, and um, we are, are very pleased that that information is now available in a form that will allow it to be uh, utilized and analyzed by people that um, are interested in that information. Um, the county has um, uh, earned uh, the county manager's office. And the county have earned uh, the uh, Excellence in Performance Data Award from the uh, International uh, City and County Management uh, uh, Association. And um, uh, we will be uh, at their annual meeting in October to um, uh, accept the award. Uh, and finally, uh, to, um, uh, to note that for the 14th consecutive year, uh, the Controller's Office has earned uh, the Award for the Outstanding Achievement in Popular Annual Finance Reporting. The, the popular in there, I'm not sure how many people actually read this report, but it is an excellent report, and it's actually presented in information that uh, is very understandable, and every year they do a great job uh, in preparing that report. That concludes uh, my report, Mr. President. Members of the board, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Maltby. Any questions? There being none. <clears throat> we'll move on to item number eight, uh, which is uh, introduction of an ordinance extending the existing voter approved locally controlled one, ha uh, one half cent retail transaction sales and use tax in the county of San Mateo for the general fund purposes for a period of an additional 20 years. Supervisor Horsley, do you want to kick this off? Just to make a quick comment on this, um, I think we you know all, all know that this is. Uh, what measure A was, and I don't know exactly what the measure will be called in the future, but this is an extension of that measure A sales tax for 20 years. I just want to say that this has been a really um, transformational um, project that really has enabled us, the county, to meet so many unmet needs, everything from, I was thinking about some of the things that we've been able to accomplish over the last few years, the big lift, that is now, I think it has over 800 children in it, if I'm not, not mistaken. It may even be more than that. Uh, th their goal is, as we all know, is to raise third grade reading from currently now. It's only 40% of our kids are reading at grade level, third grade. And we know that after that, you have to read to learn. Uh, we're, our goal is to set it at 80%. And uh, we're on our way. We are making some significant strides. And uh, we've been able to do uh, work, uh, Supervisor Pine's work on sea level rise. Uh, we've had the affordable housing fund that we've been able to do, uh, the transit services for people with disabilities. It has been really a transformational project and process that has uh, really uh, made the county be able to do so many things that we would otherwise not be able to do. We're, uh, we just talked about dispatch service for the city of Daly City. We're going to have a state-of-the-art the uh, dispatch center for not only fire, for, but for police that will protect us, make sure that um, no matter what the human or the you know, what kind of a natural disaster or earthquakes or whatever, we'll still be able to make sure that we're, our, our public safety people have the best in communication. So uh, the... Um, Oh, well, okay. and the other thing I'll just point out is about health care, too, that, uh, you know, one of the things that has been near to my heart is um, what we've been able to do on the coast side for 
we've talked about farm laborers, uh, 1,700 to 2,000 farm laborers, 15% had never been able, never seen a doctor before, never seen a doctor. So we've been able to do some really remarkable things. And like I said, again, it's transformational for the county, put us in a really strong financial position. Just look at uh, what we've been able to do with our unfunded liability uh, for the retirement purposes. And so this is, uh, I, I think this is a, motion, a move for the future to ensure that San Mateo County is uh, is able to continue to give the best in public service. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, let me just tack on to what Supervisor Horsley said, and I think first of all, thank the voters back in 2012, I think it was, uh, for approving the original Measure A. Um, it has done, as Supervisor Horsley said, I think. Uh, transformational work has uh, gone on um, district by district I mean we could name countless uh, projects that have been funded uh, the big lift sea level rise and on and on but I think looking to the future one of the things that this uh, proposed um, measure will do is it provides a, a predictable revenue stream for the next 20 years for San Mateo County and so with that predictability comes the notion that we would be able to continue funding great projects like the big lift and everything else that we've been doing in terms of filling in those service gaps. So I think that's a really important part of the equation, that predictability of a revenue stream for 20 years. And um, hopefully uh, the voters will look kindly on this next uh, measure A or whatever it's to be called. With that, um, I don't know if my colleagues would like to make a comment, but it's certainly call on John Byers to um, give us, share us uh, a few comments. Sure. I, if uh, with your indulgence, let me let me just take a couple minutes um, and uh, maybe describe what is before you, and then obviously board members will have have, have uh, uh, comments. Um, b before you. Uh, uh, for your consideration and, uh, and, and possible approval are, are two actions. Adoption of a resolution and the introduction uh, of an ordinance. Uh, the, the law requires that uh, for a sales tax to go before the voters, that the board approve both a resolution uh, and an ordinance. Uh, but when you read both documents, um, it can appear a little mechanically kind of awkward. So let me, uh, let me, let me, ex let me uh, attempt to explain. The resolution is, is critical um, and, and, of course, time sensitive as, it as its purpose is to call for the election, okay, uh, which you need to do by August 12th, uh, as, as you already know. The resolution provides instructions for the elections office to place on the ballot for November 8th uh, a sales tax measure. Also, uh, significantly, it, it identifies the 75 uh, word ballot measure question that will appear on the ballot for the voters to, to read and, you know, and vote uh, up or down. The uh, consultant Brian Godby was uh, instrumental in drafting the 75-word uh, ballot measure. It can be found in, uh, in paragraph 6 of the resolution. Um, this is, um, as you know, that's really the key, the key paragraph, um, paragraph 6. And that is the 75-word ballot, uh, again, question that goes to the voters. The resolution also contains the text of the ordinance that will appear in the voter pamphlet which means uh, we need for the board to approve the ordinance um, um, uh, today if you're, if you're as well, if you're so inclined. So let's talk about the second, act, second action uh, for a moment, that is the ordinance. If the voters were to approve uh, the measure, they're also, in essence, approving the ordinance, which, uh, again, appears in, in the voter, voter pamphlet. So in addition to, uh, to uh, approving the resolution placing the measure on the ballot, the board needs to approve the introduction of an ordinance so we can get the text of the ordinance in the, um, in the voter pamphlet. Because the board and the electorate uh, already approved a sales tax ordinance in 2012 um, by approving uh, Measure A, what is before you is, is uh, really just a simple amendment to the 2012 ordinance. Uh, we consulted with the Board of Equalization, and uh, they actually recommended that the only substantive change we needed to, uh, to make to the current um, make is, is, to, uh, is, to, is to amend the current sales tax ordinance to change the sunset date. So uh, that is what we did. 
Um, so before you is a simple amendment found in section one of, of the ordinance that extends the sales tax for an additional 20 years, a tax on an additional 20 years to calendar year 2043. So um, again, I, I uh, would ask for your consideration and, and, and possible approval of a resolu resolution calling for an election and approving the 75 word ballot question and um, the amendment to our current sales tax ordinance, changing the sunset date from 2023 to 2043. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byers. <clears throat> Comments, questions, motions? I, I would just add. I would just add to Supervisor Horsley's um, comments earlier. The um, I think the the really good work we have been able to do with additional funding for libraries and parks, um, which you know are free services to to the community, but um, we've been able to enhance a number of parks and we've been able to enhance a number of libraries and provide some additional service to 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 residents, not just in the unincorporated area, but in, but in the cities and towns. That's right. Supervisor Pine. There's no question. There's no question that Measure A has, has been transformative, as uh, Supervisor Horsley points out. And I, I think we're really doing uh, some good work now in, in getting the word out to our citizenry about what Measure A has done. I'm, I'm really pleased with uh, the efforts of, um, uh, of our, our outreach uh, staff to you know, inform people about um, how the money has been invested. Um, you know, I recently just by way of one small example, read a small piece about the Tan Faran Memorial. Um, and it was, this was really nicely done. And uh, I, I'm really pleased to see the effort we're making. You know, it's, you know, it's important for the voters to know what, what their, what their return was on their, on their, uh, uh, on their approval of, of, of the measure and their willingness to pay that tax. And I'm glad to see the efforts we're making in that area. Thank you. Supervisor Tissier. Uh, just to add on to the pile, um, I think one of the areas that I think we've done a great job in with Measure A, which I think is critical, is working with our schools for safe schools and, and neighborhoods uh, because of the mental health issues that we've seen and the incidents that have happened around the country in our schools. And we're able to, through Measure A, to be able to put uh, monies into the schools and work with the schools, law enforcement, and our mental health providers to be able to make sure we address these issues with children at a much earlier age so that hopefully we're preventing something happening in the future. So that's been a huge undertaking, but uh, well worth it. And I think, it again, it plays on the big lift and everything else. The more we do for these kids at a young age, the greater opportunities they'll have in the future. Thank you. So I think this is a great step forward. I, I know we have some speakers I haven't forgotten. But Supervisor Groom, do you? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Byers, could you just dig through the, the uh, proposed uh, language in here and give us an example of some of the possible services that might be included in Measure A? I know human trafficking is one of them, but I know there were others. Could you just run through that real quick? Well, the, so the 75-word uh, ballot uh, question itself. Yeah, I can be, if you want to take a moment and just read that, it's only 75 words. Um, <laughs> to, uh, to ensure San Mateo County quality of life by retaining, um, improving critical facility services, such as providing affordable homes for seniors, people with disabilities, veterans, families, enhancing public transit, combating human trafficking, uh, addressing sea level rise, uh, maintaining safe schools and neighborhoods, high quality preschool and reading programs, park maintenance, and low-income health care, shall San Mateo County extend the existing half-cent sales tax without increasing their rate, providing $85 million annually for 20 years that the state cannot take away. So this is kind of a, a some... What was that last part? That the state uh, cannot take away. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for... That's that's I like that the best. Thank that's, Thank that's, that's, the, that's the best of all. But, but <laughs> just a, that's just an illustrative, you know, sort of um, list. I mean, there are many other things that the board may choose to sure. uh, exercise its discretion and spend uh, this general fund revenue on. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, those comments, Mr. Byers. Public speakers. Yes, Mr. President. We have five. First one is Michael Lane, followed by Martin Fox. President Slocum, members, Michael Lane with the Nonprofit Housing Association, Northern California, board president for the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County, 
and proud Daly City resident. Um, really appreciate, we're very grateful for the work you've done bringing this forward and, and for staff. It's really so important that the Measure A funding, as you've discussed, the, the, the ability for us to be able to invest in our own citizens is just outstanding. It's really what makes San Mateo County such a special place to live and, and the cooperation and collegiality that you demonstrate with our incorporated cities as well to make sure that we're serving residents. We also know that ongoing consistent funding for affordable housing is key to really help us to be able to address the displacement and affordability crises that many of our residents are facing. And so yes, yes it's important to provide those services. We also want to make sure we're able to keep our residents here and they don't get priced out and have to move away uh, and then commute back in, uh, creating further uh, traffic congestion, et cetera. We, we're proud to say there's no tax increase here at all. This is just continuing the investments we're, we're making. And in addition to that, the sales tax will actually go down by a quarter cent at the end of this year as the Prop 30 state sales tax um, uh, expires. And so, in fact, even with the extension of Measure A, our sales taxes are, are decreasing, and yet we're still able to invest in our local citizens and keep keep projects and quality of life types of uh, types of efforts. And so uh, we're proud to support this and, and really appreciate you and the, and the staff's work on this and, and are going to support this all the way in November. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Uh, Mr. Martin Fox, followed by Linda Griffith. Good morning again, President Slocum and members of the board. Your service to the county is appreciated. An appeal to the voters considering whether to extend Measure A for 20 years would be more credible if a complete accounting of the programs that received Measure A funds were made available, including the ones that were successful as well as the ones that might not have been as successful as they might have been. Full disclosure of Measure A's successes and failures may actually engender trust and win votes to extend Measure A for another 20 years. You have the opportunity to engender trust and win votes to extend Measure A for another 20 years right now. The version of your February 23rd meeting video that is posted on your meeting website is incomplete because it omits the portion of the Measure A Oversight Committee's report that the early review of mentally ill people in jail program failed to connect 239 of the 283 persons who were released under the program with the community-based services we need, were needed. However, the version of your February 23rd meeting video that is posted on your website came to omit the report of the failed early review of mentally ill people in jail program. It is more important that it should be complete and accurate now. If you decide to put the question of whether to extend Measure A to the voters, than when the February 23rd meeting video was posted in May. If you decide to adopt the recommendations reflected on the agenda, you will find your credibility and the chances for obtaining the support needed to extend the Measure A tax enhanced the sooner a complete and accurate February 23rd meeting video is posted. Thank you. Next speaker is Linda Griffith, followed by Carol Lamont. Good afternoon. My name is Linda. I'm here on behalf of Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco. Greater San Francisco Habitat for Humanity is here today as a longtime developer in Redwood City. The local Habitat chapter that I represent is as director of marketing. We're proud to have 160 households in San Mateo County over the past 27 years. And we've done it with a strong community support and hundreds of dedicated San Mateo County residents that have served as our loyal volunteers. Our model represents 0% interest down, zero down payment loans to low income families who cannot afford the market rate homes and make too much money to afford um, subsidized rental housing. By serving families making 40 to 80% of the, our area median income, which is roughly forty-three dollars to $83,000 a year for a family of four, that means healthcare workers, preschool teachers, first responders, all can continue to live in a community that they have long called home. In Menlo Park, one family comes to mind. I want to introduce you to Evan Anderson and his family, who helps bring our work to life. Because I suspect that when you think of people we work with, you don't think of people like Evan Anderson. But the truth is, especially here in the Bay Area, many of the people who benefit most often look like Evan. Evan's a teacher. In fact, he teaches biology and math while serving as principal of a small college preparatory school. Evan's school strongly believes that it should provide students a quality and well-rounded education. Evan believed so strongly in the mission that he, he had taken pay cuts out of his um, paycheck um, to ensure his students could attend the school, even when his family didn't have um, as much means to provide for his own family. 
Yet despite his commitment to his students and his school, economic realities began to, began to take his toll on Evan and his family. He could see that 56% of his salary was being spent on housing, which meant that he was jeopardizing his own family's future safety and security. Evan's desperation changed the day he applied to Habitat Greater San Francisco. He and his wife have joined a community and um, are now happy Habitat owners. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up for you guys. Thank you. Um, but we just want to support our extension from um, Measure A and just helping our low-income families here um, and just providing them an opportunity and just really a springboard to financial security. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Carol Lamont, followed by Paul Krepka. Hello. As a member of the board of the Housing Leadership Council, I'm here to urge the supervisors to place on the ballot the measure to extend the half-cent sales tax and use tax for an additional 20 years. This measure will provide important resources to enable the Board of Supervisors to address the huge housing problem that is facing so many residents who are subject to displacement and diminution of their living standards. I've worked in this county at the nonprofit, public, and philanthropic level for over 40 years. I've worked directly with people in needs, trying to address poverty and, and the biggest impact of, of poverty and beyond is housing, the displacement that happens, the overcrowding that happens, the deteriorated living conditions that happen. And I'm proud that this county has stepped up its work to develop the policy measures, the programs, and the solutions to the dire housing problems that so many residents here face. And I commend the board for digging deep and looking at the options to put on the ballot. And I support, and our board supports, this measure going on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Paul Krupka, followed by Grace Chan. Good morning, uh, Chair Slocum and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Paul Krupka. I'm a long-term resident of San Mateo and a business owner here as well. I, I first wanted to say thank you very much to my supervisor, Groom, um, for my district and all, all supervisors and to county staff. I think you all are doing a... Uh, Great job! This is a this is an exceptional place to be, and uh, with your leadership, it's only getting better. So thank you. Um, with regard to the item today, I'm very pleased with all the benefits that we have seen here in the county of the existing Measure A, and I fully support the recommendation uh, and the ordinance itself. Um, essentially, as uh, as the attorney indicated, mimicking the existing ordinance and providing the benefit of a, a stable stream of income um, that we're willing as residents to put forward to help ourselves. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Grace Chen, followed by Valerie Riney. Good morning. My name is Grace Chan, and I'm a volunteer with Greenbelt Alliance. Greenbelt Alliance supports the right development in the right places, homes we can all afford in walkable neighborhoods near job centers, transportation options, and other amenities. Action is needed now to make it possible for Bay Area residents and workers to afford a safe, healthy place to live. Greenbelt Alliance strongly supports the San Mateo Board of Supervisors taking action to generate new funding for affordable housing. We would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for seeking out new avenues to secure long-term funding for affordable homes, and especially for the quick work to bring new funding opportunities before voters for the November 8th election. We look forward to working with you on educating San Mateo County residents about the importance of affordable housing funding in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Valerie Wren, followed by Juliana Furbringer. Hi, my name is Valerie Wren. I want to thank you all for your ongoing interest in affordable housing and, and a diverse community. I really appreciate um, your work and your forward thinking. Um, I'm a 
five-year resident of San Mateo County um, and a taxpayer for all of that time. I'm here in support of extending the sales tax, me uh, tax measure in order um, to um, to expand resources that are needed for affordable housing, in many cases for long-time, lifelong residents of San Mateo County. In particular, I would like to call your attention to the needs of the many individuals in this county, many of them born in this county, um, who have significant developmental disabilities. Uh, many of those folks are served um, in other ways by the Golden Gate Regional Center, but not for direct physical housing purposes. Uh, we need your help. I know as a former school board member in this county that in many ways the work in front of you is, is kind of encapsulated on a radar screen. I urge you to be conscious of the aircraft of these individuals, help them with their flight plans, and help them merge into the greater flight plan of this community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Juliana Feuerbrunger. Hi, I'm Juliana Furringer. I live in Burlingame, and I have been attending these meetings, and I feel very, it's very exciting to be a part of the community and be able to come here and feel like I have a voice. And um, I wasn't planning to speak, but I do believe that the Measure A extension will be significant for affordable housing, so I'm supporting it, and I'm very pleased that you're working on it. And um, as... Um, Board President of California Clubhouse Mental Health Recovery Program, I would like to see low-income housing as part of that um, affordable housing be inclu included, because I think that's, that's really important part of this. And I just think that, you know, this is the right thing to be doing. We need housing. Like everybody's saying, it is so important that we be doing this, and I'm really pleased that you are working on it. Thank you. Thank you. No, uh, no other speakers, yes, Mr. Clerk. Correct. That's all. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Other comments by board members, and I and I know Supervisor uh, Groom. I thought she was getting ready to make a motion earlier. I was going to defer to Supervisor Horsley. Okay. No. no you okay. Um, I would move that uh, the introduction of the ordinance extending the existing existing voter approved locally controlled one half cent retail transaction sales and use tax in the county of San Mateo for general fund purposes for a period of an additional 20 years and the adoption of the resolution proposing to the voters of San Mateo County to extend the addition, addition existing voter approved locally controlled one half cent retail transaction sales and use tax in the county of San Mateo for general fund purposes for a period of additional 20 years and calling an election for the purpose of submitting to the electors a measure for the adoption of an, or, of an ordinance to extend the existing one half cent retail transaction sales and use tax in the county of San Mateo for general fund purposes for a period of additional 20 years. Well done. And I, would, <laughs> I would be proud to second your motion. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. Aye. Yes. aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all very much for all the work on this item. Now we move to board member reports. <clears throat> Do Supervisor Groom, we want to start with you? I'll just say briefly that this weekend I attended the National Organization of Counties meetings for the sole purpose of uh, voting for a California supervisor to join the NACO executive committee, which was felt to be very important by the state association. So uh, say that uh, Supervisor Greg Cox of San Diego mm. County is now the second vice president of the National Organization of Counties, and everyone believes that this will get um, more interest in California counties than, uh, so we'll see. Good. Thank you. Supervisor Horsley? Uh, just uh, a journal memory of uh, Scott Lynch. He is the son of John Lynch and uh, Jewel uh, Lynch. I think many of us in the know who John is. He was real politically active over on a coast side, and you usually see him in his little uh, scooter, and uh, always he's always uh, involved in every political activity over on a coast side. But his son, Scott, was 59 years of age, and uh, 
he lived with John and, and Julie. He had a significant disability. He actually had Parkinson's disease for a, a long time. Uh, he was an avid uh, in his youth when he was able to. He was a windsurfer, loved the bay, very, really brilliant man. Had 17 pat patents, and uh, in case he succumbed at the age of 59. So our condolences to the family. <clears throat> Supervisor Pine. Um, I, I think everyone's aware of this, but uh, just well uh, put it on the record. We're very excited that Peninsula Clean Energy is preparing to launch in October. Um, notices have been provided to 20% of our residents in the county, as well as to all our small and medium businesses. Um, with respect to the 20% of the residents, um, we'll be sure that each of the supervisors receives a, a map that kind of shows roughly where these um, where the, where these initial customers reside. We we try to keep them um, in a kind of cohesive region to the extent possible. Uh, also, uh, the, the current thinking of the PCE board is to expedite the, the rollout of the, of the rest of the county and bring that uh, potentially to conclusion as early as April of next year. So it is um, coming together quite, quite nicely. Um, I'm very grateful to the support of this uh, board um, for enabling this to happen because um, it couldn't, ha couldn't have happened without the, the support of the county and this board. Thank you, Supervisor Pine. Supervisor Tissier. Yes, Mr. President, I have two adjourned memories. Uh, the first one is Ed Taylor. Um, he passed away at the age of 90 years old. He had graduated from Lincoln High School, joined the Navy, and he was the owner of the, both the Red Chimney that used to be in Stonestown and Val's Restaurant in Daly City. He's a longtime 49er, was a longtime 49er season ticket holder. He spent a lot of time in Palm Springs. That was his hot spot, as they said, for over 50 years. He was an avid golfer and a member of the Canyon Country Club in Palm Springs and also the Olympic Club. He leaves behind his uh, two sons that run the restaurant, Jeff and Greg, and his daughter, Lynette. Um, he was the ultimate family man. Um, he will be greatly missed by his family and friends. I used to see him a lot when I was living up or working up in Daly City. The second adjourned memory is Dorothy Sorensen. Uh, she was a, a nurse, and she was born in Butte, Montana, but she, her family moved to San Francisco, where she graduated from my alma mater, St. Rose. And she attended USF in Mount Zion Hospital, uh, where she earned her registered nursing license. She was a member of St. Anne's Catholic Church in San Francisco before she became a resident of San Bruno. She enjoyed traveling through the US, United States and Europe. She was a member of St. Robert's Parish Women's Guild, the Irish Cultural Center, Sons of Norway, Daughters of Norway. Um, she was just inc incredibly active. She was part of the, um, uh, the RSVP group that worked out of Sutter Hospital with the volunteers, and she did many, many volunteer efforts uh, throughout the county, so she will be sorely missed. I also have a few uh, announcements. Drive smart. Yeah. Very good. They, they retain things very well on this board, I just want you to know. We have two upcoming Age Well Drive Smart seminars. The first one in San Carlos, Tuesday, August 23rd at 9 a.m. at the Adult Community Center. And then Thursday, September 29th at the Foster City Recreation Center at 9 a.m. Also, for those of you, um, I suppose this whole board's probably eligible, Seniors on the Move conference will be held uh, October 25th at the San Mateo County Event Center. <laughs> <laughs> I put myself in that same boat. Uh, you can either contact my office or the office of Congresswoman Jackie Spear. So those uh, applications will be out soon. Most excellent report. Thank you so much. <laughs> you left at my report. <laughs> <laughs> As you all know, the Olympics is just around the corner. Yeah. And there are four Olympians from San Mateo County that will be in Rio. I wanted to give a shout out to them and let you know their names, their sports, and where they're from. Yeah, cool. There'll be 10,000 athletes uh, convening on Rio shortly. And um, there are 28 Olympic sports that will be held there. A couple of new ones include um, rugby and golf. For those of us who are golfers, which I think is all. All of us will be. <laughs> That's right. In any event, <laughs> the senior team, <laughs> senior Olympics. Uh, in any case, 
Um, the first uh, Olympian from San Mateo County is Seth Well. He's from Menlo Park, and he's on the United States men's crew team. Um, next from Pacifica is Danny Barrett, who's a member of the U.S. men's rugby team, which was just added, as I mentioned. Um, Belmont from Belmont is Marion Leppert, who's on the U.S. sailing team. And finally, uh, K.K. Clark uh, from Menlo Park, who is on the U.S. water polo team. And I understand that K.K. Clark was at the College of San Mateo last night, along with members of the team, um, actually working out in the college's uh, pool, large pool up there. So best wishes to all those athletes and bring home the gold. Also, um, on a sad note, um, or on a sad note, I just wanted to ask us to adjourn in memory of Teresa Raby's husband, Gerard. You'll know Teresa was the deputy um, assessor county clerk recorder who supervised and managed the operations of the recorder's office for a very long time and subsequently went to work for Donna Valancourt and was the project manager for the Workday uh, project. Her uh, husband, Gerard, passed away very unexpectedly um, yesterday, I think it was, and uh, our condolences out to the family and the kids, and um, he was a very young man, and um, we did uh, reach out to the family, and there's a large extended family that I know will um, be supportive of Teresa, but certainly our thoughts and prayers go out to every member of Teresa's family. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be at 1.30 doing Employee Service Awards in room 101, and there is no closed session today, so we are now officially adjourned. Thank you. All right.